Shall I begin? Okay, let's get started. Welcome to uh, the second talk of the Martin Center Seminar Series in the Easter term uh, 2021. The seminars are supported by the Department of Architecture in University of Cambridge. Today, we are very delighted to have Professor Henrik uh, Schoenfeld, also one of our, uh, the alumni of Martin Center uh, from University of Kent to give us a talk on Houses of Parliament. Thank you very much, Henrik, for coming. Um, the talk today is hosted by me and my colleague Nacha. Please be aware that uh, uh, please be aware that the talk is streaming live on Facebook, and the recording will be available on our YouTube channel. To join the discussion later after the talk, please feel free to raise your hands or type your questions in the Q and A box. Now I'm going to hand the mic over to Nacha to chair the meeting. Hi, um, thank you very much, Kai, and um, thank you everyone for joining us, whether we, you are watching on Zoom here or on Facebook Live or on Bilibili if you are from China. We are very honored today to welcome Professor Henrik Schoenefeld, who will explore the subject of his latest book, Rebuilding the Houses of Parliament, Disruptive Environmentalism and, uh, and David Boswell Reed. It is no doubt that many of you are already very familiar with Henrik's work, not least because he himself was an alumni of the Martin Center, having gained both of his MPhil and PhD from the University of Cambridge. Henrik has also told us that while he was here as a, he was in Cambridge as a PhD student, he had convened um, the Martin Center seminar, um, the lunchtime seminars for two years. And it's really great to have him back today as a speaker. Henrik is currently a professor of sustainability in architectural heritage at the University of Kent. He is also a national teaching fellow and the AHRC fellowship um, leadership fellow. His main research interest is in historic principles of environmental design, both as a field of scholarly research and architectural practice. Since 2016, he has been second to the Palace of Westminster Restoration and Renewal Program to lead the research project between sustainability and heritage. There he collaborates with the client and the lead designers to explore how histor historic principles could be reutilized in the forthcoming restoration. He has published widely in the field, including um, various articles in architectural history, the ARQ, construction history, antiquary journal, the AA files, building research and information, and building cities among other things. And so without further ado, let's now hear from Henrik. So over to you. Thank you, Natcha, for introducing me. Um, in today's talk, I would like to um, undertake a little reflection um, about environmentalism in the 19th century and using the Houses of Parliament as a form of arena in which we can actually explore that form of 19th century environmentalism. I've used this word disruptive in this title, um, and this is very conscious because that word disruptive is also in the title of my book. Um, and why this is really important is because there are some parallels between um, the problems that people were facing in the 19th century and the problem that we are facing today in terms of climate change. The 19th century environmental crisis, such as air pollution, concerns about pandemics and so on, were driving a renewed interest in the environmental dimension of architecture. And that required architects to change their practices and also to start collaborating with other disciplines. Um, and that process of having to adapt, we might describe as a form of creative destructive process in the way we design buildings and this is something that we now currently are facing up again with climate change. And I would like to start off by just showing you this slide, what's going on currently at the Royal Institute of the British Architects, who are starting to really recognize the climate emergency is affecting the profession, not only the way architects are practicing, but also the way future architects will be educated and what is supposed to be included in the curriculum of future architectural practice. And so and as, as such, we might here really talk about as much a, as a crisis of education as we're talking about a crisis of the world. Um, and this sort of 
this crisis, which offers also a lot of opportunity for exploring new ways of working, we might sort of see also as creative. Um, and I would like to sort of explore through the case study of the Houses of Parliament of how some of these crises of similar kind were actually countered in the 19th century in order to accommodate new ideas about ventilation and climate control in buildings. And this term creative destruction actually comes out of, of the work of um, political philosophers such as Joseph Schumpeter who wrote in his book, Capitalism, Socialism, Democracy actually uses the term to describe a process in which in which in capitalist society, um, creative destruction is a major force in driving innovation. And, um, and we see that this not only applies to the economy. So today we see in creative disruption very much through digital, through the digital revolution occurring, that new digital companies are coming in and challenging incumbent um, companies using older methods. Um, and they're suddenly disrupted, creatively disrupted by these new um, businesses coming in. But similarly, we might sort of see similar phenomena by external circumstances, climate change requiring architectural practices to be disrupted by the new challenges ahead, that we suddenly as architects can no longer practice the way we did before, because we now suddenly have to design buildings to, um, for a net zero carbon future. Um, and, and these sort of challenges is sort of is something that we'd like to sort of explore in the context of the 19th century. And, and why this is sort of important is because when we're thinking about the changes we're seeing today in architecture, we very often think about the contemporary city or the contemporary architecture, but it equally applies to the approach we're taking to conserving and refurbishing historic buildings. Um, and the environmental technology um, is something that is very important to understanding historic buildings in the context of the current crises. And here I've put two photographs, um, one showing exactly the same space, and this is in the House of Lords, so the upper chamber in the Houses of Parliament, where we're seeing on the left hand side um, um, a machinery that was introduced in 1966, the first mechanical air conditioning system that was installed um, in the 19th century debating chamber that had previously been climately controlled using other methods, earlier historic method. Um, and this is really important. So when it comes down to addressing issues, environmental design, and historic buildings, we need to actually go back on understanding of how these buildings were actually originally designed, how had they originally functioned. So on the other picture you see on the right hand side, you see the original um, climate control chamber with its original features. This is a historic photograph from the late 19th century that's showing how those spaces were originally used as opposed to the way they were used after the 1960s. So this is, this is sort of the relationship between a particular set of environmental principles and the architectural form of buildings that are changing. Um, and, the, and, and what my research is about is about exploring how environmental principles in the past have actually shaped the form of buildings and how that relationship has changed as technology evolved. And this was particularly marked in the 20th century when a plethora of new technologies were introduced into buildings and left, very often led to the um, abandoning of these historic methods of climate control and ventilation. Um, so and this is the work of some nine years of research that I've done on the Houses of Parliament, um, part of which I've undertaken within um, Parliament itself during the secondment, which is ongoing. And one of the fruits of this research is um, a recent book, which you can see on this slide. Um, and the purpose of this book is to provide an environmental history of the Palace of Westminster, um, covering a period of approximately 20 years, um, from the initial conception and brief development through to its um, completion and post-occupancy. Um, and what the book um, aims to show is that actually environmental technology is not just um, a static artifact, but it's something that's evolving 
And it is evolving as more experience with these principles is accumulated over time as the building is in use. And this sort of idea that the building is actually a continually learning building is very important to understand the Houses of Parliament. Um, so the book focuses much on the origin of physical technology that were implemented when it was first completed as a data focus on how they performed, how they were operated, and also how they were adapted over the course of their lifetime. So it's a sort of a holistic history of these environmental principles in the building. Um, and the book sort of engages with environmental architecture in three principal ways. One of them is to understand how the original design has actually has evolved, how it was developed, what were the original intentions behind it, then to undertake a very detailed reconstruction of its original design, and then to evaluate how the system had actually historically performed when they were in use, um, and how they were operated, and also what some of the difficulties were that they encountered when they were in use, and what changes were made to overcome them. So that is sort of the, the sort of scope of the project. Um, but aside from being an academic study, this project was also embedded in a real life conservation project, that is the Palace of Westminster Restoration Renewal Program. And in this slide, I just want to give you some indication of actually how that academic research is sort of embedded into the program. Um, and you can see, for instance, one a significant output of it was the creation of a building information model of the historic ventilation system that can be used to design um, a future system working with an understanding of those historic principles. And there's also a conservation management plan and policy that is also informed by this research. Um, so it has been quite fundamental to the program to address sort of questions of environmental design in the context of heritage buildings, not in the way that you just assume that modern technology can be retrofitted in the building and solve all problems, but that the actual starting point is an understanding of the building and use that understanding to inform a future design. So that is a, that is a very much a sort of heritage-led approach to environmental design that is sort of um, explored in this project. Um, and the research that underlies this um, project um, involves archival research. There were thousands of documents that I had to study, like letters and drawings, sketches, technical reports, and so on. Um, but it also involved extensive on-site investigation inside the building itself and seeing how the, what is, was actually built is, that is shown in the drawing, what was changed over time, and being able to relate them to each other and then to use um, a building information model to capture the, um, the entire system in 3D. And that involved um, an extensive collaboration with this team of specialist BIM model modelers to create this model. So you can see here on the right-hand side, a little section from this model, which shows the House of Lords area, showing the hidden voids of the historic ventilation system. Um, so the, the histo so what we that we might describe as a historic reconstruction. So the reconstruction of what the original system looked like. Um, so here in this diagram, I've shown you there's a process of actually doing the archival research, undertaking on-site investigation, and creating a virtual model of it that captures that three-dimensional three-dimensionally. And then there's also another dimension of it is to understand how the building operated environmentally. So looking at the, uh, how it was operated, how it had performed, and also how it was operated, adapted over time, including major um, adaptation in the 20th century that led to the discontinuation of the original system. So essentially a point of obsolescence, that we might say. Um, and in order to understand this 19th century system, we need to sort of examine different elements. Um, and one of them we might describe the architectural elements. So which one were that are inseparable from the architectural fabric of the buildings. And, you, and they will explore that a bit later and what those features are. Um, and then we got what we today would consider plant, like mechanical plant, like fans, heating systems, etc. 
Um, and then we got also what we consider an operational architecture, which is the, um, in which in the 19th century was very human centered. Of course, the entire system was operated by a team of staff rather than by computers. Um, so those three elements then are also connected with um, understanding of the internal environment, the historic internal environmental conditions, and how those were experienced by the occupant at the time. So this is sort of the, the scope of the study is to look at these elements in, in this sort of holistic manner. So from an experience point of view, in terms of where it's operated on a day-to-day -day basis, and then also distinguishing between the role of mechanical plant and the role of architecture in providing environmental conditions. Um, and this project has evolved over a 20 year period. This is an enormously long period. It's a large project. Um, and this year here shows you a sort of timeline of this process. And in this talk, I would like to sort of take you through sort of key stages in the development and to illustrate what actually led um, to the final systems, because it was a rather complicated history. Um, and to understand this process, it is actually quite important to realize that this project was dependent on the significant collaboration between a number of different stakeholders. And, and there's been a lot of literature on the role of um, of civil engineers and architects in the 19th century, um, showing, exploring that relationship. But actually what is interesting in the Palace of Westminster, there is a new a figure emerging, which we might today describe as a building services engineer or building scientists. Because, of course, the main protagonist of the environmental history of the Palace of Westminster is a physician called David Bosford Reed, um, who was involved to design the system, working with Charles Barry and his team to realize it. And he, as a scientist, didn't have any background in engineering um, or construction or architecture, but he had a scientific background and his main interests were very much in the principles of natural ventilation and also an interest in the occupant, particularly from the perspective of thermal comfort and health. So that perspective is quite important to understand what his legacy was in terms of its design and where his contribution to the design were compared to the team within Charles Barry's practice was David Boss Reed on his own wasn't able to deliver the project. So he relied on collaborating with an engineer within Charles Barry's practice called Alfred Meeson um, and Barry himself to realize his scheme because his scheme had a significant impact on the architecture. And alongside that, there was an engagement with the users of the building with, um, in particular from an environmental contour point of view, there was a lot of interest in understanding how the users were experiencing the environment that was created through these new technologies and implication of that involvement for the design. Um, and then we also got what we consider the administrative body that acted on behalf of the um, houses of the two houses of parliament, the House of Commons and the House of Lords to administer the delivery of the program of this new construction of the Palace of Westminster. Um, and what is really interesting about, about the project is that it started off with we might consider the experimental phase um, where actually environmental considerations at this um, were only considered theoretically. They weren't at this stage considered as part of the design for future Houses of Parliament. Um, so it's very important to, um, to recognize that in 1834, the original Palace of Westminster, which included many medieval features, um, um, was destroyed by a large fire to a large extent. Um, and Whilst, and after the palace was destroyed, they erected temporary houses of parliament within, within the ruined walls of the old palace of Westminster, while they were preparing new plans for rebuilding of a completely new purpose-built parliament building. Um, so, and it's, and it's this temporary accommodation that, um, that provided all the opportunity to test out new technologies. So here I've got a timeline of the overall process, um, starting in 1834 and finishing in the um, 1850s. 
Um, and it started off with actually Parliament itself, with members of the House of Lords and the House of Commons themselves defining the brief for the new Houses of Parliament, but they also appointed a specialist committee to look at the requirements of ventilation and climate control and lighting and acoustics and so on. Um, and, they, and that is really quite important because that had a completely speculative inquiry, but then at the same time appointed um, an architectural competition for architects um, that ran completely in parallel and were uninformed at this stage by this inquiry into environmental considerations. Um, and so here I got a few reports that were the outcome of various select committees that in the um, mid 1830s, so between 1835 and 1836, were actually looking into the brief and design for the future Palace of Westminster. And you can see that at the top one, you're seeing those are the reports relating to the um, architectural design. So with, with was in, within the remit of the architect in a very traditional sense. And then there was a separate inquiry, which is the bottom one, um, which looked specifically at ventilation problems in the future buildings. And it was during that specialist committee looking at ventilation that, that David Boswell Reed was first involved in, in Westminster as an expert in the area and um, bringing his knowledge as an experimental scientist um, and presenting a hypothetical scheme of how a parliament building might be ventilated and climatically controlled. And here we see a few sketches that he actually shown to the select committee, showing this idea that you can create a magically sealed debating chamber that is ventilated using chimneys, air chimneys with coke fires at the base to make the air circulate and so on. So he had a very specific idea, a particular concept of how these buildings could be ventilated. And he presented to them, to the select committees, but the select committee wasn't from the start asking these principles to be applied to the future design of the palace. The architecture competition took place in parallel without being informed by it initially. It, indeed, for the first four years, these ideas had no bearing on the design. And what this enabled Reed is to do two things. Those four years before he got um, fully involved in the design, he could undertake experiments. And one of these experiments was to erect a temporary uh, model, a physical model to run tests of his ideas and to provide further evidence that actually this idea of a hermetically sealed climatic controlled space is actually technologically feasible. So he built a model back in his home in Edinburgh to um, demonstrate that ideas would work. Um, but a year later, he was given the opportunity to actually test his principles within the temporary Houses of Parliament that was erected within the ruins um, um, after the fire. And this was these spaces that Parliament was sitting before the Palace of Westminster was completed. And this was approximately 15 years that the House of Commons was actually sitting inside a temporary chamber. Um, and here we got a floor plan that showed the arrangement in Westminster of those temporary chambers. You can see the Lord's Chamber at the top and the um, House of Commons chamber below. And this carcass of this temporary carcass was then adapted by David Boswell Reed to imply exactly the same principle that he outlined to the committee to the chamber and they involved building a big chimney next to the um, existing chamber to drive the ventilation. So thermally driven, it was essentially a stack principle. And here we got a wonderful watercolor um, from the Museum of London um, from 1839 that shows actually that big chimney on the side next to Westminster Hall, ventilating the two debating chambers. Um, this little axonometric projection that you can see um, at the bottom of the slide is actually a drawing I've done as a reconstruction of that original system. So he trialed now on the member on the actual temporary debating chamber, he was trying out his principles of a climatically controlled chamber and stack ventilated environment. Um, and here we're sh showing the interior of those spaces. So the original interior was designed by the architect Robert Smirk, um, and that was eventually then adapted to uh, realize um, Reed's principles uh, involving inserting a new ceiling 
to seal off the um, chamber from the external environment um, and to provide a perforated floor through which um, conditioned air could be introduced into the chamber and having um, loose panels at the, in the ceiling that allowed that hot air to be extracted through the chimney. Um, so actually a significant intervention here to test out these ideas. Um, and whilst this temporary, this experimental system was in use, um, it was managed by Reed himself. He was acting as the superintendent of the systems in his day-to-day -day operation. And he had the staff, had a number of staff oper um, working under him to manage the, um, the monitoring and the operation of the system. Um, and what is significant about this chamber is that it was actually systematically monitored in logbooks. So here we got a typical logbook page that show you the types of data that was collected about its performance. And this record extended over approximately 15 years, um, providing a very detailed record of what conditions were actually encountered and to draw lessons from that. In addition, also, they established a highly sophisticated system of operating the systems, including a system by which they can collect user feedback and use that user feedback to operate the system in terms of thermal comfort and so on. So quite sophisticated. So it's not just purely a technical endeavor, but it directly engages with the user. Um, and here's just an example of some monitoring data that's, um, that was collected in the chamber that I um, consolidated into graphs. And you can see here the temperatures as well as the occupancy levels. And so these were systematically recorded. Um, and why this is significant is because this chamber allowed Reed to essentially do something that we today might describe as simulations or modeling, but using physical models. Um, but what is different to the types of modeling that we're doing today is that it's actually done a building that's actually occupied by actual people rather than being a virtual simulation, um, being completely hypothetical. Um, so therefore, the, what we might consider today building post-occupancy evaluation and modeling are blurred. The boundary between them are blurred. Um, but what this has allowed Reed to do he could really test the system in use, its performance in use, and use those lessons to later inform its design for the Palace of Westminster. So it's a highly empirical approach to environmental design. Um, so when we're starting to sort of conceptualize this is that we consider like an, a conceptual phase of design that's completely theoretical, and then there is an empirical phase where the building is operated and evaluated and adapted over time. And those learning is then applied to the future design of the Palace of Westminster. So that empirical phase is quite important to the development of Reed's later ideas for the actual Palace of Westminster. Um, so in that period of ex full experimentation, last 15 years, but after four years, um, we started to actually get involved in the Palace of Westminster itself, working with Barry on the design. And this was at that moment that his ideas took become a dis creative disruptive force in the development of the plan. Um, so we now enter a stage of collaboration. So previously, Reed was experimenting completely independent from the architectural scheme that Charles Barry and Augustus Pugin had submitted for an architectural competition. Now they were brought together and had to collaborate and integrate those two different schemes, one concerned with the environment, the other one concerned with the architecture. Um, and if you're then looking back what actually Charles Barry's original intentions were, um, they were very different to what Reed was um, exploring experimentation. Um, so here we got two block plans of the original um, scheme that Charles Barry was developing. On the left hand side, you can see the plan for the original competition scheme. And then on the right hand side, you can see an adapted version of the plan that was um, reviewed by the commission appointed to select the scheme, but also by another select committee that was reviewing the choice um, of Charles Barry's scheme. Um, and what is really interesting is that in that process, they were undertaking a number of adjustments to allow 
the building to be naturally ventilated and lit. So you have a large courtyard and you've got very thin buildings around those courtyards because at this point the assumption was that the building would still operate in a rather traditional way using operable windows and fireplaces and only a few areas introduced some central heating. So it's a completely different principle. This is idea of hermetically sealed building that Reed was experimenting with. So what Reed, when um, Reed was proposing is to actually discard this whole idea of having operable windows and to completely seal up the buildings and to introduce towers to which both the air was introduced and exhausted. So his original master plan, as you might call it, was to actually have two of the big towers in the Palace of Westminster used as inlets, bringing air from a high altitude into a basement to be distributed across the building and then taken to the various spaces with inside. This includes the two debating chambers. And then all of the air and smoke was to be exhausted through one big central chimney. Um, so this was his grand concept. Um, and in order to implement that, he needed to acquire a large amount of space to move air around the building, because he could no longer just open windows to introduce the air directly, but it was indirectly introduced through those towers and through basement passages and flues, etc. So it became a completely different architecture, that, um, and that transformed the building in a significant way. So if we're looking at the original competition elevation, which we can see here, we can see there's actually very few towers on this, aside from the Victoria Tower and the Clock Tower. At this stage, there weren't as many towers as we can see now. And this is really quite significant because that was part of the transformation from the original design. And, and the original scheme by Reed was to actually introduce an enormously large central tower above the central lobby to provide that outlet for hot air, um, which are marked blue here. So this is um, a wonderful watercolor illustration of that original vision um, produced in 1844, two years before that scheme was discarded. Um, and, and his idea was to essentially that central chimney and then have in the roof space enormous network horizontal flues that would connect them to individual rooms to take smoke and air away from them into the central chimney, which we can see here in this floor plan. So this diagrammatic floor plan of the original air and smoke channels that was to connect into the central chimney. Um, and in order to connect those horizontal um, channels, they, um, they had to have vertical flues connecting to visual rooms below. And here you can see a little cutaway drawings I've done through parts of the House of Lords area, showing actually how the entire fabric had to be hollowed out in order to allow those passages of air to be created into the building. And that intervention, that created an enormous challenge to the construction because it required the entire building to be reconceived. Here's a um, wonderful historic drawing from approximately 1849 that shows some of the walls being rather hollow rather than solid because it contains those large flues needed to move hot air away from rooms into the roof space. Um, so it had a substantial impact on the internal organization and construction of the building. At basement level, all the air was to be distributed. So here you can see the basement um, that was used just to move air around. Uh, and to provide the fresh air introduced through the tower to the various spaces. And it also encroached on the ground floor space to connect the debating chambers to the central air supply network. So it took up enormous amounts of space and some of these spaces are so large you can walk through them. So even today, some of these spaces are used as offices because they're so large. Um, um, and here's a little reconstruction I've done that show you that sort of intricacy of the construction that arose from his ideas, that the heart, suddenly the whole architecture fabric was suddenly becoming um, a conduit for hot air um, to be delivered to various spaces. So this is here in the basement where those basement passages were actually connecting to the rooms above through vertical flues, which had valves in them to control the flow and so on. There was a complete central air system um, and in part of the research was also then um, tracing down where some of these Victorian controls were in the building and we still find them and here you can see some of the wooden valves and wheel mechanisms that were used to operate them by staff. So we still find 
evident in the building of those Victorian approaches to climate control. Um, but what I want to sort of highlight is that the building is significant because that sort of complexity of system was quite revolutionary at the time. Um, why the individual technologies themselves were known and had been utilized, but they had never been integrated um, and applied to building of this scale in, um, in, with such complexity. Um, and in order to understand that, it's more worth to recognize that even so the buildings like Johnson, which are known for being highly sophisticated environmental point of view, were of a different era. Um, so, and have here divided the sort of development of environmental technology essentially into five stages. So the first stage was essentially the pre-19th century um, solutions where environmental control was primarily a matter of structural fabric and simple plants, such as stoves and chimneys. But starting in the late 18th century, there was a beginning to introduce central heating technology, but they were combined with usually with direct natural ventilation using windows. But what Reed was doing, he was not only um, introducing central heating, but he was also integrating them with um, a centralized ventilation system using warm air or cooled air um, and extracted through shafts. So it was a fully integrated system. So no longer were used the windows used to deal with the problem of ventilation, but the whole system was fully integrated. And as a result, it was the architecture fabric itself that became hollowed out to contain ductwork to move those air to the individual spaces. Just to give you here an example here of the Westminster Law Court by John Stone of being a rather different um, typology where you can see there were lanterns used to deal with ventilation and doors and windows at lower level as well, while central heating was provided to warm the individual spaces, but there were no stacks, there were not sealed buildings as they were found in the Palace of Westminster. So the Palace of Westminster is really then um, a sort of move towards this fully integrated system. And this fully integrated system became um, very common by the late 19th century, major public buildings around London. So here we see the Natural History Museum from the 1873, the St. Thomas Hospital just across the river from the Palace of Westminster from 1878. And then we got the Royal Court of Justice, another major public buildings, all following very similar principles of stack ventilation, climate control to the one that we had seen in the Palace of Westminster much earlier. So what was established here became very common practice by the latter part of the, century, of the same century. Um, so that is sort of really quite important. And these sort of technology also are distinct from maybe the technology that we are familiar with in the 20th century, mechanical ventilation. They're also distinct from the principles that we see in modern natural ventilated buildings. Um, this is very important to recognize that those principles have similarities, but they also have distinctive elements to them. So if we're thinking about modern stack ventilation here, for instance, we see that very often chimneys were connected to individual spaces to ventilate them through one chimney. Um, while in the Palace of Westminster, there was one chimney ventilating several hundred rooms at the same time through a network of flues. So we have a rather different architecture of stack ventilation. So that's really quite important to recognize when it's come to utilizing those historic principles that they follow a similar logic, but have a different architecture and might require different technologies to make them work. Um, so what is interesting in is that this application was not easy. So the, we have seen that this system was highly complex and made the building much more complex than it would have been if they had followed Barry's original plan of simple operable windows and fireplaces, some central heating maybe. So it became a highly complex process and that collaboration to achieve that became a major cause of disruption and delay in the delivery of the projects and there were various select committees that actually reviewed the situation. So here we see a few reports that were produced in the, um, in the 19, 1840s, reviewing the problems between Reed and Barry in implementing that system. Um, this is really, I think, quite important. But aside from the technical problems, there was also a problem of making the scientists collaborate 
with an architect and engineer. And there were a lot of investigation and trying to understand how the collaboration could be made to work because Reed was not very familiar with construction. Um, and there was also a misunderstanding of actually where the disciplinary boundaries lie between a scientist and that of an engineer and that of an architect, let alone how they could collaborate to achieve a holistic design. So there was a lot of, lot of investigation into actually how to make this process work. And they're not going to go into that in much detail, but I explored that in full detail in the book. But here in this diagram, it sort of captures almost these sort of interaction between the different parties to make read work within a team of specialist architects and engineers. So today we might say they were just about starting to recognize a new emerging profession, which we might describe as the building scientist, um, being partly becoming part of the disciplinary teams, not just the engineers and the architects or the surveyors, um, but also the, the building scientists suddenly becoming a figure, but not knowing how to integrate them into the team. So there were various processes of how actually the work undertaken by Reed and Barberi could be integrated. They had considerations about workflow, of actually how that knowledge that he was providing could be successfully integrated and complemented by the others. And so on. There was a lot of investigation experimentation in that, and they had real trouble making this actually work in practice. But they were really exploring what we might today, today describe as a cross-disciplinary practice. They were beginning to really explore the prospect of having a larger cost disciplinary team, yet struggling to make it work and define the um, roles successfully. Um, and in the end, they had to actually appoint a um, royal commission to actually uh, moderate the collaboration between them to making sure that the collaboration worked well. I mean, aside from tensions between the two, it was there was a in there was a significant process management issue. Um, so that is sort of the two elements of disruption, we might say. There was a physical one, which is about changing of the building, and there was a disruption in terms of the working practices within Charles Barry's team that were resulting from the system. Um, and it was due to this difficulty in their relationship that was eventually um, the Houses of Parliament intervened. So the House of Lords and the House of Commons had another inquiry um, in 1846 where they reviewed their relationship and what the House of Lords had decided that we should no longer be involved in the process because they thought he, would, he was the problem. And they were never, they didn't trust that the new way of working could be established to make their working relationship work effectively without causing further delays. So in 1846, the House of Lords was separated. So the area of the Palace of Westminster that was um, uh, owned by the House of Lords was given completely to Charles Barry and Reed was no longer allowed to work on it while Reed was continued to work on the House of Commons area. So as a result, they split the system into two. So here in the diagram, we can see suddenly that collaboration was split. The collaboration was only um, now in the area of the House of Commons that Charles Barry and Reed still had to collaborate, while the House of Lords, in terms of ventilation and climate control, was passed on completely to Barry to finish. Um, so as a result, we have that sort of split. And that politically driven split um, also had a direct implication for the physical design of the building. Um, and one of them was that the um, two systems were divided through a physical wall. So here we've got an original drawing showing that wall that was built between Barry and Reed. So you see red and blue. So they're marking the House of Commons and the House of Lords areas being split by a wall, um, now operating as completely separated system, one under the control of Reed and one under the controls of Charles Barry alone. Um, and here we're seeing also split within the basement, so that originally meant to be one central air supply was now split by a wall in the basement, again between House of Lords and Commons. Um, and as a result of that, also they decided to discard the idea of one big central chimney and introduce lots of small, um, small stacks. And again, the architecture changed. We suddenly have lots of turrets appearing on the roof line of the Palace of Westminster to meet those new ventilation requirements. So we're seeing here the, um, the roof plan again with network of flues that were established while Reed was still in charge. So they were actually built and they're still there today. 
but they inserted various new towers into it so they could ventilate different sections separately from each other rather than everything through one big central chimney. Um, and here we've seen a historic photograph that shows the various new towers that were added on to the buildings that led to its rather picturesque qualities. Um, and, and here's a little axiomatic drawing that um, were shown how these channels that Reed had introduced were now connected to individual small um, chimneys, connecting into them rather than going to one big channel chimney. So here's one in the Royal Court area, so which is opposite the Royal Gallery. It's one of those small local chimneys that were used to get rid of the smoke and air of a particular section of the building. So we might call this a devolved system of stack ventilation rather than a centralized system of stack ventilation that Reed had intended. Um, and, and what this meant is that each area got its own stack. So this includes a House of Lords, we're seeing on the left-hand side, which was now under various control, got its own chimney. And then the House of Commons, which is on the right-hand side, got its own chimney, ventilation chimney. Um, operating completely independently from each other. Um, so transforming the architecture in a rather fundamental way. And here is a little cross section I've done through Barry's Lord's system. And you can see where the green is, that is where the junction is between the House of Lords and the House of Commons. So the central tower that was meant to link the two chambers was no longer connected to the House of Commons. It was only potentially linked to the House of Lords. So this was a result of the political decision um, and here is a little reconstruction I've done of the original um, REIT system in the House of Commons that has evolved after that split. So highly sophisticated system that drew on the findings of the experimentation in temporary houses in a fundamental way, highly sophisticated operational design. And once both houses were completed, both Charles Barry's and REIT system, both of them were subject of extensive scrutiny and evaluation. Um, so there was a period from 1847 through to 1854 that their performance was actually scrutinized by members and were also systematically monitored. So in the House of Commons, for instance, we had logbooks where everything was recorded just in the same way as they were done in the temporary houses. There was data collected um, that gives us a real insight of how the system had actually performed in real life. Um, we got also records of actually how these environments were experienced by users again, and those were noted down in logbooks, giving us a real understanding of how those conditions were actually perceived by its occupants. Um, and there were also really sophisticated um, systems of managing the system, and again, this idea of evolving MPs and lords of the main building users within um, um, a user feedback system that was carefully managed was implemented within the new chamber based on the experience they had done in the temporary chambers where they had trialed these ideas and refined them over several years. Um, so the established practices that one became dominant throughout the 19th century. But aside from these sort of routine monitoring procedures, this, the performance of the building also became subject of debates, which is really interesting. You wouldn't assume that actually question of ventilation or climate comfort and so on would actually ever feature um, as a subject of debate, but it was actually, particularly in the House of Commons, where there were significant issues with the control of the environment, it became actually a subject of major debates, um, um, where the Lords and the Commons were actually reviewing the experience of what um, they were doing with these new systems. Um, and it even came, went as far that they appointed select committees to review them. And there was eventually in 1854 that decided that the system should be revised and modified to achieve environments involving a new approach developed by another physician called Goldsworthy Gurney. Um, so the system was completely remodeled um, still using the primary infrastructure established by Reed, but utilizing in a completely different way. Um, so there was a transformation. And again, it was parliament that based on their experience rather than on the measurements that were making the final decision about the fate of the system. Um, so, so after Reed, you might say, there's a period after Reed um, where the system started to become adapted. So the system that was installed wasn't static. It was subject of inquiries and adaptation. So here's a little reconstruction drawing I've done of the original Gurney system 
um, where they actually decided to have it completely stack driven, where a read system involved um, a fan driven supply as well, and a fan driven extract system. So they combined steam powered fans with stack ventilation. So they were um, a hybrid system where Reed decided to have the whole system driven entirely by chimneys. So he used the same infrastructure that was built, but changed the way the air was moving to allow the system to happen. So in this case, the, uh, what was used for the air supply was suddenly used for to extract air from the buildings to provide the larger chimneys needed to pull air out of the building. Um, and there's also an interesting intervention is that David Potts Reed originally envisioned the building to completely hermetically sealed. So spaces like the House of Lords was originally built with no operable windows. The glazing, the stained glass windows was fixed entirely. Under Gurney's regime, they started to introduce operable windows that at least temporarily could be opened to provide some natural ventilation to complement the mechanical system of climate control. And they'd established a regime by which that those window systems could be utilized. So we got suddenly a sort of a hybrid emerging or where the return to operable windows as, as a backup system was introduced into its design. And, and we might sort of say that this building was all about learning about environmental control because this building wasn't static. They were continuously re-engaging with this problem of how to climatically control and ventilate a building of this kind. And again, throughout its entire post occupancy history, and this is over 150 years, they were systematically monitoring it. They were undertaking more inquiries, some led by select committees, others by scientific committees, et cetera, and were doing tests of various kinds. Um, and here I've just shown you a few examples of tests done in the 20th century, some monitoring done in the, um, in the early 20th century, scientific correspondence on reviews undertaken and so on. Um, so the building never stopped to actually be a subject of investigation. It was essentially an ongoing engagement. Um, and even the pandemics, something that we're facing now, um, in the past was a major concern. So we had an influenza pandemic in the early 19th century. Um, there was a major concern to members of the House of Commons that did actually specific study, just looking at microbes um, within the um, chamber and how actually diseases transmitted, whether it's through droplets from people speaking, whether it is actually airborne, whether the air is able to carry um, viruses, um, or whether it is through surfaces that we touch. So similar things that we are just um, thinking about in COVID-19. Um, they were then trying to scientifically evaluate actually these public health issues in the chamber during a major influenza pandemic. Um, and the building was then continually adapted as more lessons were learned from it. So here's just a few examples of new filters being introduced, new fans being introduced to enhance the, the ventilation in the House of Commons chamber, for instance, new cooling methods being introduced. Um, so there was a process of continued adaptation. So that incision that we have seen in 1854, where Reed and Barry systems were substantially remodeled by Gurney, that process of experimentation actually never finished. It never ceased. It continued throughout its operational life. Um, and I've written actually two papers that retraces that entire um, in post occupancy history. One of them looking at the pre-war era and the other one looking at the post-war era, um, because this process is ongoing up to this current day. Um, and I would like to sort of conclude this lecture with a, um, a final note saying that actually we might conceive this building as having remained an experiment throughout its entire life. The experiment that might have started in the temporary chambers with um, Reed um, actually continued throughout its operational life. Um, and we might sort of say that that post occupancy history of the building is telling us that actually buildings are learning buildings. Um, that are continuously evolving. And that I think is very important because that knowledge of adaptation showing us actually what the limitation of the systems were both from the user experience perspective, from a technological perspective, and also in relationship to new challenges in terms of the external environment, for instance, how the system could cope with increasing temperature, how it could increase with increasing levels of pollution. All those were pressures on the systems and led to reinvestigations of how the building was performing. 
So it was a continually learning building and the organization in charge of its operation was engaging continuously in that process. So I hope that gave you a bit of an overview of that sort of history um, of the building as an environmental experiment. Hi, thank you, Henry. That was just, that was wonderful. That was really interesting. I really enjoy um, the lecture and especially really enjoy seeing those diagram of the workflow uh, when you talk about um, the work between and the communication um, between Barry and Reed's team and um, the cooperation between time scientists and architects and draftmen. Um, it's really fascinating to see those diagram. I I, I just um, want to open up the floor to um, the audience to ask the questions. So um, just a reminder. So now we have now stopped all the broadcasting.